Good morning. Our topic is economic development strategies for a more affordable and inclusive city. Economic development is a fascinating term because it is such a different concept from economic growth. Economic growth means what just happens out there in the economy or what doesn't happen. It's a them kind of thing. Economic development, economic development means what all of us thinking together can do to shape growth if we put our minds to it. It's an us thing. And it takes the form when it works of a vast, continuing, all-inclusive conversation. A committee of the whole. The beloved community, as Martin Luther King called us. Its premise is that the built environment isn't just something around us, because it's also something within us. Cities don't just build fortunes, they build people. They accelerate human understanding. Physical and social environments are inextricably linked. The modern city, for instance, came into being over a century ago when former farmers learned how to be urban citizens, thanks to a slew of new inventions. For instance, department stores that taught them how to shop together, apartment houses, which let them live together, ballparks, which gave them a sense of unity, vaudeville theaters, which helped them laugh at their problems and themselves, parks and libraries. Today, in a different time, when a city thirsts for hope and is eager for inclusion, a hunger for reconvening and relaunching that great conversation that we can all participate in has given us both a new administration and an outpouring of new ideas I hope you've all had a chance to look at the MAS booklet, New Ideas for New York's New Leadership, and has also given us uh, a packed house this morning and a great panel and a wonderful keynote speech to address great problems. Realizing, as one of our panelists, Brad, said in a memorable report a few years ago, development as currently practiced in New York has simply become intolerable for many New Yorkers. Let's begin with a single question for each, and let's begin with Kyle, a one-two punch after Carl, uh, a transition in himself, president of the Economic Development Corporation under Mayor Bloomberg and under Mayor de Blasio, a tale of two EDCs, <laughs> an agency moving from concentrating on big standalone projects to becoming part of something even bigger, an all-agency approach that Carl just mentioned to housing and job development. Carl's a hard act to follow, but you're the perfect person to do so, Kyle. Please tell us a couple of ways in which the new EDC can put community involvement and economic and social diversity at the heart of its work. Sure, well, thank you. Um for having me, and it's funny, I, I get the question a lot about uh, the tale of, of two EDCs. Um, I would say it's, it's been an interesting transition uh, between the two administrations. Um, for those of you who don't know, I was uh, really only president of EDC for the last six months of the Bloomberg administration to sort of finish out uh, a number of different projects, um, get a number of things through ULERP. And the mayor asked me when I, at a certain point, I said that, you know, I think I want to ask for my job because um, I really like this job and I think it's a, a fantastic way to have a professional career in the city. And the mayor asked me at a certain point, he said, when I was interviewing, he said, why would you want to stay? Aren't you exhausted um, after six and a half years at EDC? And I said, I am tired, don't be perfectly honest, but um, I said, this is a job that I would do for free. And I said, the reason that I would do it for free, um, if I could afford it, um, which I can't, uh, <laughs> is that um, the agenda that this particular administration wants to bring to bear in terms of economic development um, sort of was more, more, resonated more with me as a professional. Um, and so the ability to bring to bear what EDC can bring to bear in terms of its power throughout the city um, was a great experience uh, and a great idea for me to sort of experience how to do that. And so, to answer your specific question about how we're thinking about economic development, so the last administration I would characterize as being very focused on economic, physical, uh, economic development in a physical form. 
So very focused on physical transformation of the city and long-term economic diversification. So uh, a good example of uh, long-term economic development of transformation is something like applied sciences, where the city is giving half of Roosevelt Island and $100 million to create uh, a new engineering school that will benefit the city for decades to come. And that project has already started uh, underway, but the, you won't, the city won't really see the full value of that investment for another 10 years. So that's sort of an example of something, a big picture economic transformation. And then you have the physical transformation, which is sort of the investment in parks, uh, some of the infrastructure investments, and those kind of things to, to really tr transform the city on a physical scale, the water tunnel, those kinds of things. I would say that this administration is still very focused on those ideas, those big picture physical and, and economic. But what I, I'm also very interested in, and, and I think we all share, is that they're also very focused on economic resilience. So finding a city that in which creating uh, our, an economic development policy and strategy that is focused on making sure that it's an inclusive economic development strategy, that it's not just focused on attracting net new to the economy, that it's making the economy accessible for the people who are here, and that is something that transcends all the different projects that we're thinking through. And you know, on one hand, the last we were really good in the last administration about creating jobs. On the other hand, the jobs that were created are jobs that pay $40,000, generally speaking, pay $40,000 or less. Um, so, and that's not something that's a sustainable way for the city to live. Um, you have seen a flat poverty rate, but actually you've actually seen an increase in poverty among families who have two working adults not a sustainable way for the New York City to continue. So I think what this administration is focused on is saying it's fine to transform. We have to think about big picture, long-term economic development, both physically and infrastructure, but we also have to think about creating a city that is resilient economically. And so that, that's the major big picture transition that I'm seeing. Thanks. Thanks, Kyle. Uh, Brad, I quoted your memorable report, One City, One Future, a couple of minutes ago, a report that makes a ringing call for shared prosperity and condemn the big squeeze that too many New Yorkers have been undergoing to the extent, as the report said, that they can no longer see what's in it for them. That report took dozens of groups four years to put together, but that was five years ago. Please revisit that vision and tell us whether you think that affordable housing, housing a cause for which you've fought for 20 years, can now become a permanent part of New York City's agenda. Uh, thanks so much, Tony. Thanks to MAS. This is a wonderful opportunity. A panel it was great to hear uh, Carl's keynote. It's a very exciting time in the city. I think this hitting of a reset button on how we think about the city's physical development and growth and what it can mean to try to make that genuinely work for all New Yorkers, or at least a much broader swath of New Yorkers, is a fantastic set of challenges and a really hard one. Uh, you know, we, so I think the, the core values being projected in the plan so far uh, are extraordinary and I'm very excited about them. I also think there's a lot of hard work to do. So all the minds in the room, we've, we've got our work cut out for us. So I guess one step back, I think our, our historic ideas of economic development and growth, uh, you know, in my, in my mind that sort of field comes from the 50s and 60s and the idea that you could promote growth in a way that would work for everyone, sort of stoke economic development, create jobs, and everybody would benefit, is sort of where people have started. The challenge is that when the city transformed, when uh, manufacturing jobs were substantially lost, when that sort of model of a middle class economy was hollowed out, um, and what replaced it, not just in New York City, um, and not just as we're seeing around the country, but really around the world, is a, a more unequal model of, of the economy, uh, promoting and stoking that model of economic growth here uh, through the Giuliani and Bloomberg administrations, um, even when it created a lot of new real estate value and in some cases a lot of new jobs, also amplified inequality. Uh, it's not surprising the jobs that the economy was creating in recent years were you know, some high-end jobs in finance and real estate, um, and a lot of low-wage jobs. Um, so the plan many of the plans of the last 12 years accelerated those dynamics, and then when you overlay the affordability crisis on it, 
So not only are you getting an unequal model of job creation, but the very development you're doing is stoking a rise in property values that has this enormous squeeze uh, on people who find it very challenging to find affordable housing and whose wages are flat or declining, it's not surprising that many New Yorkers found it hard to see growth as being for them and that the development plans felt like they were on the side of gentrification, on the side of a model of economic development that was not focused on uh, creating affordable spaces, preserving affordable spaces, creating middle class jobs, and just uh, inclusive communities that create opportunities for everyone. Uh, it, over time, they became more focused on sustainability and in some cases on some neighborhood investments that create more livable communities, but pretty, in pretty narrow places as sort of drivers for real estate growth as opposed to being spread around in all neighborhoods with those focuses on affordability and opportunity. So now we turn to this wonderful moment where there's a desire to make that happen and all the big challenges of how. So uh, I'm thrilled with the way that the table has been set I think the idea of focusing on affordability that Carl laid out and that the administration has really pushed on uh, is obviously centrally important. If you can't live in great neighborhoods, they sure aren't great for you. Um, uh, I think the model of focusing on maintaining mixed use, manufacturing, the work that Adam Friedman and the Pratt Center have been working on for such a long time, uh, uh, ha happened to be coming along at a moment when there's an administration commitment and a shift in some of the uh, economics of, of manufacturing and light industrial uh, jobs that make it viable for New York City. Um, but I will say that I think there's a couple of really hard challenges and I'll be eager in discussion to face them. Uh, one is how to make all of that genuinely work in the context of neighborhoods. Uh, and that is really hard, right? The right answer is not, in my opinion, let's just trade density for affordability as it sometimes gets kind of crudely reduced. If you look at the housing plan, it's much more ambitious than that. It says, let's drill down and look at neighborhoods and think seriously about how to make growth work for those communities and for a wider range of New Yorkers. Um, and that is a really hard challenge because there's not infinite value. People are very resistant to new tall buildings. Uh, and they're concerned about where the school seats are and how good the transit is and how whether their parks are in good shape and whether there's a library and um, you know and how where they're gonna park and a whole set of issues that we have to look at uh, in a bigger context about how to make growth work for those neighborhoods keeping a real focus on affordability but looking at this broader set of questions. We're setting out to do that right now in Gowanus, and I encourage folks to go to bridginggowanus.org if you wanna see the work we're trying to do in advance in hopes of being strong partners with the administration in achieving a very difficult balance between preserving manufacturing jobs, preserving and creating affordable housing, uh, cleaning up the canal, investing in the infrastructure that the neighborhood needs to be a great place, really hard challenges. And then the last thing I'll say, and then hopefully we can kind of come back and talk about these things in dialogue, is we do also need to balance looking at the city as a whole with looking at neighborhoods one at a time. We've got an exciting opportunity. The 10-year capital plan is coming up in January. But at this moment, having seen what a hurricane looks like and does, being mindful of climate change, of the need to make systemic scale investments in transportation and resilience, how do we balance, and, and not having enough money for simply the state of good repair investments, much less the ones that would really create the bones for the 21st century city that we want. How do we balance looking big while also drilling down and, and looking at neighborhoods? So it's a big set of challenges. I'm glad we got a really smart room full of people to help solve it. Thanks. Thanks. Mindy, um, the week before the mayor's uh, incredibly ambitious housing plan was made public. Another public report of importance came out. Controller Scott Stringer issued his own report uh, pointing out that although the Bloomberg administration had created or refurbished 165,000 apartments in 12 years, during the same period the city lost 400,000 of its most affordable apartments, those renting for $1,000 a month or less. You've written powerfully about the psychology and psychiatry of place, about how displacement and the loss of stable neighborhoods undermines the health and cohesion of the entire city. How do we open up the new conversation about the city 
to keep an eye on all 325 neighborhoods and all eight and a third million people who are New Yorkers. Um, so I'm a psychiatrist and my discipline is social psychiatry. And what I'm interested in and what I, what I study is how social structure creates health. As, and, and the thesis of my discipline and what I work from is that tightly organized communities, the technical term is integrated, but it's not simply the old, it's not simply about racial integration, it's about social connection, that this is the foundation of all health. And I think that it's important, nobody so far in this conversation has really explicitly said that New York City, like every other American city, has been involved in many decades of policies that sort the city by race and class and that have undermined and destabilized neighborhoods. In fact, New York City, like almost all American cities, has been very active in what my research group has called serial displacement from policies of urban renewal, planned shrinkage, um, and now gentrification. Serial displacement is a fundamental attack on resilience because it moves communities, it disperses people, it breaks social bonds, so it destroys the actual foundation of what makes it possible for us to live together as human beings. And so in the wake of these policies, we have seen a series of terrifying epidemics um, the AIDS epidemic, the crack epidemic, the violence related to the crack epidemic, the mental illness related to the violence related to crack epidemic, some, some illnesses that strike cold terror in the heart of all physicians, like multi-drug resistant tuberculosis, which could take this city down and all cities around the world. And we know that we are not only in a series of terrible plagues, but that by changing the ecosystem in conjunction with global warming, we are creating conditions for diseases we have never seen before that we don't know how to manage. And so all of these policies, which have been city policies, they've been federal policies, state policies, city policies, that have undermined the capacity for us to create stable neighborhoods, have created diseases that can bring us down. Public health cares about the body politic because that, the body politic, if it's not functioning, it's like having your own body not function. You're out of the game. So resilience is fundamentally about building human community. And there has to be some capacity at this moment of resetting the button to say, oops, that was a bad idea. There is a piece of this that has to be about truth and reconciliation. Between 1960 and 1990, Harlem lost 30% of its housing. Some parts of the South Bronx lost as much as 80% of their housing through planned shrinkage. These were devastating to those neighborhoods and fed the worldwide AIDS epidemic. So I, I think it's essential and, in my, and I think that um, the point of my book, Root Shock, it, which was about urban renewal, was to say, let's really learn from the past. It's part of our path. But we have to like, like look at it with a kind of open mind to say, okay, we see the costs of that and we wanna go forward. And if I may just add, as a psychiatrist, I had the great opportunity of working with the Municipal Arts Society on Imagine New York, which is, um, as a social psychiatrist looking for the healing of the city, Imagine New York was a phenomenal project. And I think that the project that won, the Think Project that won What to Rebuild, what really captured the feeling of Imagine New York. Um, but what was built was something else. But Pataki said, we're not gonna build what everybody picked, we're gonna build the new World Trade Center. And I think that the, the, that stands for, for me as a psychiatrist, the suppression of the agony of the city, the agony of the region after the World Trade Center. And that what we are seeing now in this reset button is really a reset from then, from 2002. We're resetting like, wait, we have feelings about this city. We have a vision of this city. There's a city we want. It's a city of peace. It's a city of connection. It's a city of celebrating diversity. It's a city of stability. I heard that in every Imagine New York workshop I went to, the longing for that kind of a city. Bloomberg and Pataki turned away from it. But I think the people have spoken in electing this administration that their hearts are set on this other New York. And if you go back to the Imagine New York documents, you'll see what the people want. Thank you. 
<laughs> Hugh, um, you've said you hate the word housing because it sounds like shelving people and that our real job is to make real communities. In your career, you've done so much to restore joy to beloved landmarks and icons, Brooklyn Academy of Music, Radio City Music Hall, the New Victory, New Amsterdam theaters, among so many others. How do we move beyond housing in creating a city that will create 21st century citizens? Oh, nothing to it. Uh, <laughs> we have to agree first. What do we mean by affordable? And what do we mean about inclusive? Uh, and we have to discover that, of course, the public is us. It's not us versus them. When Bryant Park was first imagined, Warner Leroy was going to produce a, 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 a succinctly enclosed place with fences. And you didn't have to pay to get in, but there would be guards and so forth. On the thesis that the public felt unsafe there. And if you had guards in uniform at the entrances, you could then go to Bryant Park and feel free because if there were a problem, and somebody tried to do something wrong, they'd be thrown out because the fences would, would allow that to happen. And so that, that was sort of the ultimate idea of us versus them. The success of Bryant Park proves in so many ways that we are the public. Lyndon Miller was criticized because she was going to plant gorgeous gardens, and she did. She planted stuff that everyone said, you can't do that because they'll steal it. Well, in fact, they didn't steal it, they took care of it. And if somebody <laughs> leaned over to pick a tulip, they'd get looked at strangely, unless they were four years old. Uh, it, it's amazing to see how cared the public was of Bryant Park. Now, what it's becoming is a whole other discussion about public versus private. But it is a public space that is maintained, and it has been so successful that the properties around it have risen in value, and there is the, the, the equivalence of a window tax. The landlords are paying to support the park, which raises the idea, why can't public space be sustained by those around it? The High Line made a mistake in the sense that the people who are getting rich aren't the people who develop and sustain and maintain uh, the High Line, it's the developers and the stuff around it is what's making all the money. That, whoops, that isn't quite right. Uh, so there is a question, I think, about who is the, all this for? It's for us. It's our city. The unusual thing about New York is not just that it's a great marketplace. You come to New York because it's a media capital. You do whatever you want to do. You fly in from all over and hit the press, and then you're known around the world. But we live here. This is our city. And so what does that mean? Uh, the astonishing thing to me is the fact that it is truly inclusive if you accept the city as a whole. And I agree that there are signs that we understand that, that we are the public. It isn't them. We are it. We are the city. Now, not just the people in this room, furthermore, if you look around this room and check us out in relation to the city as a whole, you can see we all have work to do. Anyway, uh, <coughs> the other thing that appeals to me is the thought that uh, th there are these different communities that make this whole idea work. There's the political community. and. I think it is more open and responsive than it has been about what the future might hold. There's the financial community, and it's got rules. We've got to be more inventive about how money works. Money is this extraordinary substance. It really has no value it is, it, it, unless it's related to something else, except in the games that the financial games of Wall Street where money has no value at all. It's just about money. It's about zeros. It isn't about what money can do. Then there is the legal community and the code requirements and the regulations that attend something called housing are awesome. And if you do high rises, 
they're even more restrictive. I'm a little nervous about the idea that we can quickly produce all this housing because to do that we'll have to use the same old rules. And alas, these communities uh, that are developing in this city are people live differently. They don't live, the middle class <laughs> may even be disappearing and it certainly doesn't live the way it used to. The living room, the dining room, the bedroom, the what have you as a layout. What's that? Many people don't even need a kitchen. Many people haven't cooked in their lives. Many people live only on takeout and the requirements to have some of that uh, kitchen stuff and the cost of it and the arrangement of it and the thought that the kitchen is where you prepare food and the dining room is where you eat it and the living room is where you have conversations is all obsolete basically. Some of that is caused by poverty. If you see where and how really poor people live, you see they're living in a completely different kind of lifestyle than what the code requires. And so I suspect if Somehow, we've got to worry about the, the community of regulations. Uh, one other thing, in doing that, the big high rises which are gonna generate all the money and move the city forward because they're on, you know, they're visible and it's proof of change and all the rest, and the money has spun off and through proper regulation, we'll have enough loot to take care of our public space. But how about existing buildings in little sites around? I was amazed that when the former administration correctly issued an astonishing report called uh, New York 2030, imagine an existing, uh, uh, an existing administration talking about life after it existed. Uh, that, that's most rare. And w it was astonishing to me that some of the ideas, of course, of what, what were proposed, they were all about new buildings. There wasn't anything about existing buildings. Strangest thing in the world. Here is this amazing stuff we all take for granted, not even considered as a part of the future. And so the use of existing buildings and the reuse of them seems to me absolutely essential. That's where you bump into the landmark question. That too needs to be addressed. We've had 50 years of the Landmarks uh, Commission. It's gonna be celebrated next year, big birthday party, everybody be very pleased. I think it's time to think again about the purpose of preservation. Who's it for? What does it mean? Is it really possible to take a building out of time and freeze it so that it can never again change? What is the purpose of preservation? Who's it for? How is it going to work? And that would re perhaps lead to a looser, more interesting relationship about existing buildings. So anyway, I could go on and on, but d aren't we lucky to be living in this time where things are in the process of being redefined and we've got to get to work and push the right levers, buttons, what have you, to make all those constituencies, the political, the financial, the legal, and the community, all have their own languages, their own goals, their own uh, curiosities, we've got to put them together to make a new city. Thank you. Uh, <laughs> while we've been talking, the wonderful Municipal Arts Society staff has been circulating amongst those of you who are not sitting in director's chairs to gather questions that uh, we can address and uh, we will do that before we finish. Um, Mindy said that, uh, the, remi reminded us that the city found new purpose and unity after 9-11 through the Imagine New York process, but that at the same time, there has been a suppression of the agony of the city. So we live with that tension. Um, Brad talked about the hard challenges. Um, oh, here are some questions now. Uh, and before we get to them, how do we tackle the hardest challenges of a city that knows what it wants and a city that has been told it can't have what it wants? Kyle. Um, wow, that's a tough question. 
I, I, was supposed to be. <laughs> one of the things that we have talked about, um, and that's uh, one of the ways, sort of the new look at development in this administration is sort of manifest in the in the lexicon is um, sort of neighborhood development initiatives, and so we've. I think the real question, I'll sort of answer your question with a with a pseudo question, which is, I think it the answer sort of depends on how we as administration end up defining what neighborhood development initiatives actually means. And I think it's specifically what Brad said, which is how do you actually do the ground up listening process? And how much of that is about the community input? How much of that is about looking at the data uh, and looking and, and taking long-term projections about uh, where neighborhoods are going? And um, you know, in many ways, it's an art and not a science. But I think the, the answer to that question lies into how we actually put a framework. You know, as Carl said, we're gonna take, we're gonna look at neighborhoods, neighborhood by neighborhood, and mandatory inclusionary zoning by neighborhood by neighborhood, and density neighborhood by neighborhood. Um, but it really does kind of depend on how we as administration put a process and a framework around what neighborhood development actually means, and uh, what ground up listening process actually means. And I would submit that it's absolutely, absolutely part of listening to the community, uh, either through community boards, um, charrettes, um, and really working with uh, religious and CBO leaders in neighborhoods. But I think it's also um, something that we did not, have not done really in the last administration is looking at the data and, and really crunching the data to see what's actually happening in neighborhoods. Because there's a lot of health data, there's a lot of income data, wage, movement, infrastructure data that we have that we are not looking at as a whole and making a, a data view about what is going on in neighborhoods, where neighborhoods are going, and what kind of strategic investments we could make to keep neighborhoods on the right track. Brad. So, I mean, let me just add to that, because I think partly what we have in the room is a lot of people who are taking part in growing things from the ground up already, and part of what we've got to do is figure out how to put those things together. So, um, you know, we, we, you, you talked about Bryant Park. Um, you know, we have Laura Hansen here who's working on this neighborhood plaza partnership to take these spaces that were street and got made into sidewalk or into plaza with the opportunity of making those neighborhoods more livable. And now we'd like to fill them up with, and they're being filled up with these emergent stewardship groups. Um, but they're hard to sustain because they're not, it's not going to be done off the values of the surrounding properties on a sort of bid-like model. So how do you take that neighborhood energy and put it into community planning? I don't know if you saw this fantastic new video about uh, New York's public branch, uh, branch public libraries that's up on the New York Magazine site last week. If you haven't, please go watch it. Like, what's preserving the souls of our neighborhoods in so many cases is things going on the ground, whether that's these emergent small manufacturers, whether it's what's going on in the branch libraries, whether it's what's taking place in the livable streets uh, movement. So this, you know, I guess I, you know, this is to sort of build on your point. I think, look, we need uh, a big picture. We do have to start. It's why I mentioned the 10-year capital plan. You do have to think from the big infrastructure first. What can the city sustain? How's it going to do it? How do we need to make those investments that are for the long term? And then how do we balance that with um, these challenges of affordability and the challenges of really capturing what's best in neighborhoods already? And I mean, I, sometimes that is the buildings and certainly preserving some of the wonderful uh, architecture in the in the built environment is a part of it, but some of it is preserving and strengthening other things that are growing in neighborhoods um, that we're not always good at accounting for. So I just hope that'll be able to be in the mix as well. Mindy. I, I think there are two things. One is that it makes me nervous when people in cities talk about transforming neighborhoods. Um, it, very nervous because what I see in the wake of that is disease. And uh, there's not a proper respect for the need of human communities for stability. And oh, I, we absolutely have to solve this housing, the, the disappearance of housing that regular people can access. But how do we do that in a way that honors uh, that people being connected to each other is what keeps us healthy? And so I think there's a, a missing piece that has to be brought forward. 
which is human relatedness. And how that becomes an official part of the New York City planning, I think, is the key piece. Um, and we sociologists have taught us how to talk about this. It's a, there's a very good science of it. That's you know certainly my work comes out of this. What are hum what is human connectedness? I think the Municipal Arts Society is the master of how to look at human connectedness, but it has to be on the agenda. And some of the destruction of human connectedness has to be on the agenda because we are in a repair mode. So if we don't put, if, if and I know you're, you're really thinking about this, Councilman, uh, but it's gotta be said very explicitly that, that human relatedness has to be the goal, preserving and repairing human relatedness. One thing I, one thing I would, one thing I would say is, sorry, um, is that um, so with the housing plan and the potential rezonings that uh, Carl talked about, so with 200,000 units of housing, uh, the goal is 60% uh, preservation, 40% affordable. If you do the math, it basically works out to about 8,000 units of housing, uh, a new product, a new housing a year. So le setting aside production, um, we will have to create basically 8,000 new units of housing a year um, to uh, meet the goal within 10 years. And uh, many of you are familiar with a project uh, on the Lower East Side called Seward Park. Um, and to just put it in perspective, Seward Park is 1,000 units of housing. And so the idea that we are going to do eight Seward Parks a year in terms of scale uh, is not lost on any of us that that's going to be a big challenge. And so when I talk about transforming neighborhoods or looking at neighborhoods, we have to balance what's happening in neighborhoods. Um, and I don't want to make it seem like we're overlooking what's happening in neighborhoods, but we're also recognizing that we have to balance um, this affordable housing goal with what's actually happening in neighborhoods. And I think Brad makes a good point in terms of the public space. But my answer to your question or your, your point, which I think is, I would also say is, is it's going to be important for us in not just getting lost in producing 8,000 units of housing a year, um, but that we incorporate design and the, how those communities that, that we're creating or the, you know, the vacant lots, for example, that we are putting online and putting housing in or those kinds of things, that they relate to the community, that they are hopefully housed with people from the community, and that design addresses the needs of that community. And I think a good example of that um, is a project that I hope to see more of is, a pro is, the, is the Via Verde project that Jonathan Rose did in the Bronx, which incorporates some of the principles of biophilia in, in how that housing relates to both the people who live there, but also the people who live in that community and who otherwise enjoyed that space as a, as a green, essentially. Uh, and they actually took something, a public space, and made it actually potentially something better from it. So I think, I hope that we uh, do what you're asking and that we also incorporate, and we are able to use design as a way to help with the healing process. It, it, Unfortunately, it, I've been flashed the five minute warning. Uh, it, it, it's essential that those small scale projects which offer the opportunity to try new ideas quickly versus the big high rises which are so mired in regulation, you really can't change how they're configured but the small scale stuff you could, and I really believe people are living differently than what the regulations assume. And so the more you could flesh that out and prove that they were pleased and happy and accommodated, because you know, what a family is, is changing in its dimensions. And let's not get into the mothers. What, what do you do with the old mother? What do you do with some of the relationships that are now perfectly standard in this society? Uh, the physical fact of the housing doesn't recognize that, and it doesn't permit change. There, there, it's perfectly possible you know, in, in, to put up a wall and make things different, but it's not legal because it isn't filed that way. Wait a minute. It could be if it were imagined that walls were going to actually change in the course of time, and they do. All the illegalities, it's sort of like language. You know, language changes and people misuse words and they finally become acceptable because everybody knows what those words and phrases mean. Same thing is true about regulation. Very quickly, here are some of the spectacular questions uh, that have been brought up to me. 
Well, pick up on Carl and Brad and Mindy's comments, there is recognition of synergy between community organizing and planning and density slash development. East New York and Gowanus experienced multi-year planning efforts. Other neighborhoods are targets for development, but have not experienced planning process. But there's a time pressure. What is the city's commitment to planning? <clears throat> How to pace and sequence effort? And also, while I laud the vision of economic integration, which is a core tenet of the housing plan, I worry about displacement and root shock. Can we address economic exclusion in situ for the residents who live there? Clearly, this is the beginning of a long conversation. It's wonderful that MAS will be reconvening that conversation throughout the years to come. But final comments from the panel? <laughs> for the time being? I, I would like to say that I think that I think that MAS has a really critical role to play at this moment. In and, and I think that what was great about Imagine New York was that people had a, this amazing vehicle to say what they were dreaming of. And it was a remarkably healing event. Of all the events I saw after 9-11, it, it was Imagine New York that really healed, healed a lot of people. Um, and, I, and I think, therefore, convening something, what is the Imagine New York of today to really bring the public's voices into this process would be an extraordinary contribution. I, I applaud the fact that we've all said this is not just about housing. It's not about putting people somewhere. It's about building community. It's about making a better city. And I couldn't agree more that what's happened downtown through the official construction of official monuments isn't about making a better city. You remember when Ada Louise Huxtable wrote about the culture of death and criticized the idea that the whole effort was to make a graveyard for perfectly understandable reasons, but it wasn't about inventing a new city. That's our generation can do that. I would, I would just say that um, at the Economic Development Corporation, you know, we are going to be involved with uh, our sister agency, HPD, in, in implementing the housing plan. But I also don't want, you know, the, in this room, uh, economic development to, uh, in terms of inclusiveness and as a strategy, is much more than housing. And so um, we're also very committed to uh, making sure that we bring the power of the city to bear in terms of wages, um, in terms of workforce training, because one of the things that concerns me, has concerned me for a long time is, as I said, we've created a lot of jobs, but there's no way for someone to leave those jobs um, because they're not getting the right skills training and there's no skills acquisition um, during the process. So I think to us, you know, there's housing and there's workforce and then there's everything else. Um, and at the Economic Development Corporation, we're sort of working on all of it. Um, so I, I just wanted to say to this crowd, I thank you in advance. For, I get um, a number of good ideas um, from uh, this people associated with this agency, this organization, and just thank you in advance for um, the ideas that you have given or will give us, uh, and thanks in advance for your support and what we're doing. Uh, maybe two final challenges, one that I hope people in this room will sort of challenge and hold accountable the city and the administration, and one that I want to kind of push and, and challenge uh, you on. Uh, first, while I think there really is an appetite to see the city and its neighborhoods in broader context and the things that make uh, growth and development and change genuinely work for all New Yorkers, um, 200,000 is a big number and the housing plan and the pull of achieving it is going to pull in the direction of units and while there's a, a read the housing plan, it's got goodwill on these issues holding, pushing for these issues of sustainability, livability, design, uh, more broad and inclusive neighborhoods. It's just a thing that people have to keep pulling the other way on. And so I think that is a helpful and productive challenge and tension that I hope folks at MAS, as you have for 150 years, will keep doing in this administration. Um, but I also want to push on really taking the challenges of inequality um, and the diversity of the city uh, more seriously, that is also hard to do, and the founding concerns of MAS are, uh, need to be seen in broader context, right? The preservation communities, the early goals, um, 
they don't need to be the preserve of the elite or the preserve of Manhattan, but the work to see those things in the context of low income and working class communities with a very different built environment, with very different uh, communities of people living there to really listen uh, and to think about what strengthening working with those communities to strengthen quality of life in those neighborhoods in ways that make sense uh, given the lived experiences and the leadership and the desire of people in those neighborhoods is just as important. Uh, there's no community that where people don't want uh, a vibrant, livable, safe, uh, you know, beautiful neighborhood. And we have to push ourselves harder uh, to think about what that really means and looks like. Immense thanks to Kyle, to Mindy, to Brad, to Hugh. An extraordinary panel, uh, an honor to be sitting amongst you.